Uh, good evening. Um, thank you all for coming uh, tonight. My name is Jonathan Nichols Pethick. I'm the director of the Polium Center for Contemporary Media. And it, uh, it, it is a great pleasure uh, tonight to um, welcome you to the uh, last speaker in our series for the semester, um, someone I've wanted to have uh, join us for a while now. And we were able to um, convince her to come and speak to us, Indira Lakshmanan, um, from currently at the Pointer Institute. Um, but I just want to say thank you from uh, as my in my role as a director for coming and supporting our series and uh, enjoying our, our wonderful speakers. I'm going to um, uh, introduce my colleague, uh, the distinguished visiting professor of uh, journalism, um, the Polium distinguished visiting professor of journalism, Miranda Spivak, to introduce uh, Indira to you. So, Miranda. Thanks everybody for coming out. Um, so Indira, you may have heard her on National Public Radio. She has hosted a number of programs there, but she interestingly, I learned tonight, got her start as an art history scholar, uh, which just goes to show you that we journalists are true generalists and can tackle almost anything. Um, she has been a foreign correspondent. She worked for the Boston Globe and was in Afghanistan and Bosnia. She's interviewed Fidel Castro, Benazir Bhutto, who was actually a speaker here at one point in the past. Um, she's written, she has written the letter from Washington column, which uh, was in the International Herald Tribune, which is now, of course, the International New York Times. Um, she was at uh, Bloomberg and also in, um, has actually, I met her because she had very briefly become a freelancer, which is a very dangerous uh, task to undertake. And we were in a writer's group together actually in Washington. So um, now she is at the preeminent journalism think tank, which is the Pointer Institute, and that's in Florida. So she's really been all over the map. And the interesting thing about her position, which she, she can tell you a little bit about, is it was endowed by Craig Newmark. I don't know, do you know who Craig Newmark is? Craigslist. <laughs> he has a really fascinating interest in trying to improve journalism around, certainly around the country and maybe around the world. And so she is holding the, eth the first Newmark ethics chair at the Pointer Institute, and she's doing a lot of provocative things to make journalists and the people who read and listen to journalists think a lot about all the difficult issues of the day, everything from combating fake news to trying to figure out how to cover the current sex scandals that are going all around the country. So um, without further ado, here's Indira Lakshmanan. Thanks. Thank you for that incredibly kind introduction, and thanks to all of you for coming out um, on this already cold night. Um, and I'll correct just one thing that Miranda said, only because since we're here talking about what's fake news and what's real news, um, I I have profile I have interviewed um, Benazir Bhutto and Hillary Clinton and General Musharraf and a bunch of people like that, Hugo Chavez, but Fidel Castro I profiled but did not actually get to interview him. I met him, but he wouldn't sit down for an interview. He just talked for three hours, so that's not really that's not really an interview. <laughs> so just to correct that, anyway, um, so. I'm, I was asked by Jonathan and Miranda to talk about uh, a big issue that all of you have been hearing about a lot, I'm sure, for the last year, which is this term fake news, and talk about what it is and what it isn't. So um, I know some of you are journalism students, and some of you are just members of the community who are really interested and committed to journalism, I hope. So I'll, I'll try to give a talk that sort of is at all levels, and I'll be really happy to take questions. And speaking of which, I should ask, how long um, would you like me to speak versus take questions, approximately? All right, sounds good. All righty, so let's get started. Fake news, this is a term that we all started hearing uh, about a year ago this time. So what is fake news? Fake news is not news that you don't like. 
or someone else doesn't like. That is not what fake news is. So we all know that President Trump very, very um, cleverly, I have to say, um, in December of last year, after he was elected president and people started talking about fake news and whether fake news might have influenced certain voters or possibly influenced the outcome of the election, he very cleverly appropriated the term and turned it on its head by saying, you, the mainstream media, you're fake news. So any report that he doesn't like, and now a lot of other politicians have followed suit, and they now say anything that they don't like that's negative about them, critical of them, that's fake news. But no, that's not what fake news is. Fake news can have a lot of different reasons behind it. So it can be motivated by money. Um, as you all know, in the digital space, every click that someone clicks on an article or a story, there are ads that are being viewed and you get, it might be a couple pennies per ad for someone viewing your page, but there's still money in that. So it can also be motivated by politics, by people who want to Pers you know, push a certain candidate or put down another candidate, it can be motivated by the need to create chaos. And here we're talking, of course, we now know Russia's involvement in our election last year and bots um, that came out and amplified and repeated certain news stories that were in fact fake to just sort of make a mess of our system, whether it was to support um, Donald Trump or support Hillary Clinton or just to make us look bad, creating chaos. Okay, and they can also be, and this is in a sort of old school way of our understanding of fake news, and I'll get to this later, they can be a smoke screen to keep you from noticing other stuff, to sort of confuse, and the old term you know, I'm sure you all know, is smoke and mirrors. All right, I like this uh, little matrix, which I got from the University of Arizona, and I really like it because I think it lays out very clearly this sort of, this matrix of intent, to, de to deceive or not deceive. Okay, so for example, in the upper right-hand corner, I mean, I love The Onion, those of you who may know The Onion. Most of us know by now, all these years on, that The Onion is a joke, that it's satire. It's not really, they're not really telling you that all these crazy things happen. Um, I will say that I, I told this to Miranda and Jonathan, I spent seven years in China as the Boston Globe's Asia bureau chief, and every once in a while, a crazy story would be reprinted in China Daily or the People's Daily, and the source of it was The Onion. And I felt a little, you know, it was funny, but it was also like, oh, those editors don't realize that The Onion is a satire site. It's not really real. Um, but at least at that point in China, um, sites like that didn't exist, satire sites. I'm sure that by now they probably do. So that's one. Another example where you're not trying to deceive um, and it's not financial is just plain old humor accounts. Like you see these... Um, you know, parody Twitter accounts like Real Don J. Trump. I mean, I'm sure you've all seen things like this. On the other side, hoaxes. You see things like the Macedonian teenagers who wanted money for sneakers and created all sorts of crazy, very clicky, catchy, completely made up stories during the 2016 campaign to fund their sneaker habit. They weren't trying to support, you know, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. They were just trying to get people to click on their articles. And then at the bottom left-hand corner, this is the worst case. These are people who are doing it for propaganda reasons. So making up stories entirely, like may, many of you may have heard of the Pizzagate, the so-called Pizzagate scandal, where someone read a bunch of emails of John Podesta's, who was Hillary Clinton's campaign chairman, um, emails, come on in, you can come in and take a seat, um, emails that had been hacked and then released by WikiLeaks. And uh, there was some reference in there of him buying pizzas um, for a party. And so someone decided, oh, this pizza parlor must be in cahoots with Hillary and John Podesta. And out of absolutely nothing, out of whole cloth, they created a story saying that there was a child pedophilia, sex slave thing going on in the basement of this pizza parlor. I'm here to tell you that was actually my local pizza parlor right near my house where I took my children all the time and it was extremely upsetting. This was a pizza parlor that let that held all sorts of fundraisers for our local public school, um, for all sorts of things. And I said to my husband when this came out, when people started making up on the internet that they were involved in this pedophilia thing, I said, mark my words, something terrible is gonna happen as a result of this. And indeed, a man from North Carolina who was fooled into thinking this was real, drove up 
to Washington, D.C. with a gun and went in and fired a few rifle shots off in this pizza parlor, actually on the same day that we were headed right there. Um, fortunately, nobody was hurt, but he also discovered that not only was there no child sex ring, there was not even a cellar. So this supposed cellar where this was all taking place, there was nothing there. And the story was that he went and checked all the doors and there was nothing. He even went, insisted on going into the refrigerator um, of the pizza parlor and found that there was nothing there. All right. I know that earlier this semester, you guys had Craig Silverman come from BuzzFeed. So some of you may have heard Craig's talk. And this, I want to say right up, is all credit to Craig. It was a, a reporting he did, which I thought was brilliant, after um, the election, where he looked at the top 20 fake news stories. And by that, I mean headlines like, Pope Francis endorses Donald Trump. Completely fake. Never happened. Another headline. Um, FBI agent investigating Hillary Clinton found dead in murder-suicide. Also completely false. Never happened. Pizzagate. That's another one. So those top 20 fake news stories versus the top 20 real news stories. And by that, I mean every real news organization that you can think of. New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, Fox, real news organizations. And as you can see, the gap here is one point, nearly 1.4 million more um, engagement, likes, shares of the fake news headlines than of the real news headlines between August and Election Day. That's really disturbing because it means that's what was getting traction, the fake news. All right. I think that a lot of this goes back to an underlying problem we have in this country, which has been the decline in trust of the media. The fact that well-meaning, one hopes, Americans are looking at crazy news and thinking, oh yeah, that must be right, or are completely distrusting the mainstream media and throwing them in the same pile with completely invented, you know, trolls who go on to, um, you know, message boards or go on to 4chan, which is a Reddit group that you may have heard of that's dominated by white supremacists, and they equate it all. This goes back to a problem that goes back decades. It's certainly not something Donald Trump created. He capitalized on it. The problem is a, a declining trust in institutions in this country. And it's not just the media. Um, it began in the 1970s, and the decline in trust has been decline in trust of Congress, the White House, the media, you know, many institutions that we think of, state and local government. There's been a decline in trust of all of those things. Now, Gallup has been actually looking at this since the 1970s. This particular graph, as you can see, only goes back to 1997. But it shows that the decline in trust in the media specifically, um, I didn't pull every graph here, um, is much more pronounced among Republicans and to a lesser degree independents. Those are the dark green and the medium green lines you see, whereas Democrats are still above 50 percent, um, even at the lowest point in terms of trust in the media. And um, we had a conversation about this, and I think that part of this goes back to the fact that in the 1980s, under Ronald Reagan, um, there was a deregulation of the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, and the elimination of the Fairness Doctrine that had required um, the network newscasts before to present all sides. Once that was deregulated, it allowed for the rise of talk radio and cable news. And the idea was that there were going to be so many perspectives out there that you didn't need to represent all perspectives in one news show. Um, what that laid the groundwork for, however, what really profited from that was the rise of talk radio, but specifically right-wing talk radio. And of course, as we know, Fox has been one of the most successful cable channels that developed starting in the 90s. And Roger Ailes' entire business model was to become popular by trying to attack trust in the existing means of communication. So saying, don't trust the New York Times. CNN was, of course, starting around the same time. So it was, don't trust the New York Times, don't trust the network news, trust us. You know, they're not giving you the real story, we're giving you the real story. So part of the whole thing was, it's now been a couple of decades of repeatedly telling people who are their audience, don't trust anybody else. We're the only ones giving you the real story. And what this does is it erodes, as you see, because they were giving a conservative point of view, trust in the general mainstream media has been eroded, particularly among Republicans. All right. This is a graphic I pulled out because it's been interesting to see this over time. So this particular graphic is from, um, I think it's 
January, if you can read it. Does it say that, January, if I'm reading it correctly? Okay. Um, to Anyway, this was early in the year. And um, it was that in this particular case, again, you can see how it differs between Republicans and Democrats, whether you trust the national political media or Trump's White House. Those are striking numbers. This I polled for you from May. I think the last one was March, actually. This is the Pew Research Center, which, if you're interested in studies about the media, really does some fantastic research on the media. And again, you see how trust in the news media really, do you believe national news organizations? Do you believe your local news? And generally, and you see this across the board here, people across all political parties trust their local news more than they trust national news. This is significant because, as we know, local news across the country is just being eroded. Um, the, the business model has been sort of knocked out from under them, and there are more and more media deserts, fewer and fewer places that have small town papers or sustainable business models for local news, and that is a real shame because people do tend to connect with their local reporters, people who they know are writing about the issues that they care about in their community, people who they see out there, and they know that's a real person. That's not just some, you know, person I don't know who maybe I see on TV, um, this is a real individual in my community who goes to my community institutions and cares about what I care about. So that I think is quite interesting. And it, it's a real call to arms, I think, for trying to restore local news media. All right, you see how this changes over time. Here in October, so just recently, Trump or your favorite news source, still among hardcore Trump supporters, and, that, and then you see here white evangelicals, strong Republicans, even soft Republicans, a strong trust of Trump over the media, despite what the Washington Post has been doing all year and many other fact-checking organizations. The Post in particular has painstakingly cataloged every statement that the president has made and has found that on average he makes five false or misleading statements per day. So despite that, it doesn't, it doesn't shake these numbers. And I think that's really interesting because Fact-checking is a real movement in, um, in journalism today. And there's a lot of money and resources being put into people just very dryly giving you the facts. Here's a particular statement, regardless of which politician or person, it not, doesn't necessarily have to be political fact-checking, it can be things about climate change, it can be things about health care, about whatever. Here's a statement, now let's just give you the dry facts about it. What's interesting is that a lot of the new studies about fact-checking are showing that, A, it's very hard to convince people to believe fact-checks, even if you give them everything footnoted, you link to your original sources, it's very hard for people to believe it because of what? Confirmation bias. People believe what they want to believe. If they're already pre-programmed to believe something, something that tells them that's true, they're going to like they're going to share it. Something that tells them they're not true, they're going to dismiss it. I mean, we're all guilty of this, right? I mean, this is this is pretty true. Any of you who have social media feeds, ask yourself honestly, do you share and like things that go that challenge your own point of view? Probably not. Um, so, you know, the problem is that people, it's very hard to get them to believe fact checks. They're much more likely to believe fact checks if the person who is the validator is someone who you wouldn't expect to be a validator. Let me give you an example. If there's a fact check saying, um, you know, fossil fuels um, do cause global warming, they're much more likely to believe that if someone from the American Petroleum Institute were to say that than if, you know, someone from the Sierra Club is going to say that. So that's an important thing for fact checkers to find genuine validators who say something that goes against what their perceived interests are. But another interesting thing about fact checking and the potential limitations of it are that they've found that even if you convince someone that a particular fact is not true, they tend to say, okay, so you got me. So Donald Trump lied about that or Brexit the argument, the economic argument for Britain leaving the European Union is not good, but I'm still going to vote for that anyway. So that's another thing we have to think about, that facts aren't the only thing that determine people's points of view. There are a lot of times when people are doing it for emotional reasons. They're voting whatever way they're voting, not necessarily because of fact checks, but because of um, their own their own feelings. This is what I was telling you about earlier, the change in confidence per institution. I was telling you about it from the 1970s, but this is interesting just this year, just since January of this year. Um, so, you know, that's I, th I think those are pretty interesting. All right, 
in worldwide, I just wanted to quickly run through these to just show you that worldwide in terms of trust in the media, trust in the media, as you can see, is much higher in countries that are very repressive towards the press. Um, UAE, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, these are countries that do not have a free press. And yet, interestingly, um, you know, there's there's more trust in in the media in those particular countries. And this is, again, to show you that across the world, trust in non-government non organizations, sorry, um, has gone down. Let me see if I can get that back. Um, non-government organizations, um, business, media, government, all of those have gone down, the trust in all of those institutions. That's worldwide. And this is trust in media plunging to an all-time low, basically globally. All right. This I thought was interesting, and I pulled it just to show you that um, in the United States, there's a 21-point gap between the people who are considered informed public. So I guess fairly educated people who actually read the news, people like yourselves who care about the news, versus mass population, people who can't answer basic questions about the news. And that's that is that's that 21-point gap gap, which I thought was really interesting. People trust institutions more if they're more knowledgeable. If they read more and they consume more media, they trust institutions more than if they don't. Okay, so this is another little matrix here just to show you about. There's information, there's misinformation, disinformation, so intentional, and propaganda. And I'm just going to go through this quickly with you. So misinformation, you know, again, to not blur the lines here, misinformation can be something as simple as the facts changed from when the article was published, the journalists misunderstood what their source was telling them, or the source misunderstood or exaggerated. And this is addressed in good news organizations by corrections. It's simple. That's not fake news. That's just somebody made a mistake, and they correct it, and they publish the correction, or they utter the correction if it's broadcast journalism clearly. So they can be out of context or misleading, but it's not intentional. Disinformation for financial gain. So this is front groups. So I'm talking about groups that, because it's not in their interest, are going to do the whole smoke and mirrors, confuse you. Um, and this we have seen in the last few decades over th these sorts of issues, leaded gasoline, asbestos, DDT, a lot of them environmentally related or health related issues, cigarettes, vaccines, climate change. On a lot of science and health issues, you see front groups that are associated with a particular industry who have either sponsored studies or put out people, you know, posing as or seeming to be experts on something to just try to muddy the waters and say that something is not what it is. Disinformation for political gain. Okay, so I want to just give you an example here. Um, this is someone t who calls themselves America First, tweeted out on the day of Rex Tillerson, the Secretary of State, his confirmation hearing, tweeted out this picture, or this video, watch. This is during the break. He's testified, he's gone off for lunch for his break. This woman comes out, we don't know, I don't, we don't know what she's doing, but this person tweets out, who is this woman and why did she take these pictures? And then they say, turns out it was Doris Trong from the Washington, and they call it Compost, who took photos of his papers while they were on break. So this person just jumped to this conclusion and said that that's who it was. Okay, so then immediately gets picked up from someone who is not a reliable source. He's, he or she is an anonymous Twitter person who calls themselves America First. Uh, is that Doris Trong? I mean, who is this person? How do they have this information? And suddenly you see everywhere in all these sort of blogs, um, you know, things that are not, again, not vetted media. The liberal media becomes more unhinged by the day a reporter was caught sneaking photos. Okay, something called truth feed, which is again a very sort of um, hyper-partisan um, and a lot of it made up because guess what? It's cheaper to make stuff up than to actually have reporters go out and do stuff. It's cheaper to just have a couple guys in their pajamas sitting in their basement just writing stuff and putting graphics on it than actually employing a news staff. Busted, WAPO reporter caught sneaking photos. They're, they're saying these are his notes and here's her camera. Okay. 
suddenly gets picked up by the Drudge Report. The Drudge Report, you may know, is one of the most visited sites with a conservative bent. And look at this. Washington Post reporter caught sneaking photos of Tillerson. Okay, Drudge aggregates news, but usually legitimate news sites, but sometimes not. So he's just aggregated this. Sarah Palin picks it up, and she tweets out to her millions of followers, busted, this is creepy, snooping, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so here's Doris Trong. Here's the real Doris Trong. Washington Post homepage editor, and she tweets, hey everyone, that wasn't me. So I've talked to Doris about this. She's a friend of mine. Doris wasn't even at work that day. Doris is an editor. She's a homepage editor. She never leaves the building. She doesn't ever go out and report on stories. That's not her job. Her job is to sit behind a desk and push out digital stories. That was not her. It doesn't even look like her. Um, to me, it doesn't even look like her, if you know her. So the point of this is that people get hold of things and just say things that are not necessarily true. This was not her at all. Nobody ever apologized to her. We don't know who the person was who put that out. We also don't know who was the woman. Nobody, nobody has come out and proven who was that woman and what was she doing? Was she taking a picture or was she just standing there? We don't know. And the other thing is, of course, this is Congress. It's the people's house. People can go there. Anybody can go. Any of you could go to Congress and go to Rex Tillerson's confirmation hearing or anyone else's. Presumably, he's not going to be leaving secret documents out on the table while he's gone to lunch. But that's another question. So here's my final point. Ask yourselves as consumers of the news, go through the same sorts of questions that a journalist would go through about any information. These are the basic questions a journalist would go through. What do we know? How do we know it? So who, what's your source? Have you checked it yourself? Is it accurate? And is it true? Something can be sort of marginally accurate but out of context. What is the journalistic purpose of this information? Who is affected by your actions and how you convey the truth while minimizing harm? Those are, those are the questions that I think ethical journalists go through while they're making their process. So I am happy to, uh, to hear your questions and to talk about fake news, trust, whatever you want. Yes, sir. Can you identify yourself? And I'd love to hear your question. Thank you. <coughs> My name is Robert Calvert. I'm a retired professor of political science here at, uh, at DePaul. And um, I've been concerned with the media for some time myself. And the question I would put to you now is this. Shortly after the announcement of the, of the, of the uh, um, election results in 2016, some very prestigious reporter, and alas, alas I can't think of his name now, mm -hmm. thanks to my memory loss, um, said in a prominent uh, article in a prominent journal, and the title almost of his article almost says it all. The title of his article was Media Culpa. Mm -hmm. And his point was, we in the media did not see this victory by Donald Trump coming. Hmm. And guess what? Hey, nobody disputed that, that I can recall. And they didn't. And it was a surprise to everybody, except those who were paying attention, as Hillary was not, to us here over in flyover country. Mm -hmm. Okay. What, what do you make of that claim, the, this prominent journalist, that the, the media was responsible for not seeing Trump coming to a victory? That's not an, an original observation. I mean, that person was one among thousands of journalists who made that media culpa, um, you know, not, okay. the, that, not that same quote, but that thing. I mean, the media has basically been, I, I would say, uh, soul searching since last November asking wh how did they get it wrong? How did they not know? But there are different levels of this because I will say that journalists who were actually out on the campaign trail, and my husband is a photographer, and he went to scores of Donald Trump rallies in 2016. And he told me before the election, Donald Trump is going to win. He said, you mark my words, Donald Trump is going to win. He said, I have been to these rallies and the enthusiasm gap between his rallies and Hillary's rallies, you know, he said, it's just, he, he was sure of it. 
And it was interesting to me because it was, of course, going against the conventional wisdom in Washington. But I think that people who were out there, on, and it's not limited to him, people who, the reporters who he worked with, I think, shared his feelings. So I think the issue is not that there weren't reporters out there on the campaign trail, not that nobody knew. I mean, there were literally hundreds of thousands of words more millions of words written about Donald Trump's rallies before he became the nominee and after so there were plenty of people who knew very well how popular he was the problem was that Washington I think becomes an echo chamber where you know a narrative comes out oh look at the national polls Hillary's leading in the national polls and indeed she did win nationally by three million votes but not in the right states of course and so I think the problem is you get this overarching sort of meta narrative where people say well this is the way it's going to be the polls are saying this they're not looking carefully enough at the state by state polls and then it becomes sort of groupthink and you see it in the Sunday shows and you see it in sort of the meta and analytical coverage. But I think the reporters who were actually out there on the trail knew very well how popular Donald Trump was. And if you read those feature stories, I mean, I can sit down with you and point them out. All those stories were there. Um, and, and, you know, several of my friends who are national political reporters say, you know, that's hooey. I, you know, I wrote about this all the time. People, people may not have been listening, but I think it's also true what you say that people at sort of more influential people in the media may have drowned out those voices by thinking, by relying so heavily on national polls and not enough on state by state polls. Thank you. Yes, in the back. Hi, I'm Reed, a uh, senior comm major here. Um, so you talk a lot about how the media needs to kind of build their trust back up uh, mm -hmm. over the coming, and it's going to take a while to do that uh, over the coming period. But what do you see in the next couple of years to really get going on that path to building up that That's trust? That's a great again? question. Um, I, you know, I don't think, like I said, I don't think that the distrust, just taking a step back for a moment historically, I don't think that the distrust in the media is a new thing. It's been happening for decades, as I said, and I said this to Miranda and Jonathan before, that I also think that the high level of trust in the media, in the mass media or mainstream media, as we call it, in the late 1970s was probably an ahistorical aberration, a blip. And I think that it was because in the post-Watergate period, um, you know, regular Americans credited the Washington Post and the media with exposing Watergate. They credited the media with exposing what was going on in Vietnam. So the media had kind of props for that. Also, keep in mind, that was at the end of three decades of network news coverage of just ABC, CBS, NBC, and sort of the respected Walter Cronkite type anchorman in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, where all Americans were sitting down in their living rooms at the same time every night and listening to a vetted source, someone who they trusted who was giving them basically the same information and that as I said started to change with the rise of talk radio and cable and internet and lots of other sources but even before television before network television think about it in every town and I I say that Greencastle I imagine was probably the same there would have been a labor paper there would have been a sort of you know capitalist bosses paper there would have been a communist paper there were partisan papers throughout American history there was not like one dominant view so in a way maybe the 50s through the 70s were kind of an aberration that said, I do think that we need to increase, we need to figure out ways for all institutions to regain the trust of ordinary Americans, not just the so-called informed Americans, and uh, Americans of all parties. And, um, and I think that for the media's point of view, I mean, like Congress has to fix its problem, um, you know, NGOs, banks, corporations, every institution in America that has a lack of trust. And by the way, the ones you'll, you may be interested to know, the institutions that have not suffered such a decline in trust are the Supreme Court, the military, and the police. But this was data that was a couple years old, and I don't know whether since police brutality was more exposed, whether that has changed for the police. I don't know. Um, 
with the media, there are some, and this is one of the things I'm working on, is is working with scholars who are working on this, trying to, and practitioners trying to figure out what are some of the ways to restore trust. And one way is there's an organization called Solutions Journalism Network, and full disclosure, I'm on their advisory board, but they do kind of hard-hitting, tough journalism that shows here's a problem, here's a solution, Here's why it works and how it works, where it works, and and showing models that can be sorry replicated elsewhere. So one example of this is um, a story on Brazil's uh, how Brazil addressed its AIDS epidemic and how they gave out antiretroviral drugs basically massively to the population and gave them out to the poor and how this brought the AIDS rate in Brazil down from being like one of the worst epidemics in the whole world of AIDS to down, way down, and how other countries started imitating that. So Namibia, South Africa, other countries learned from Brazil. That's an example of solutions journalism. Bring it down to a local level. If you have local newsrooms where where news editors are looking at problems that actually matter to that community because they live in that community and they know what is the issue, whether it's education, whether it's potholes, whether it's healthcare, whatever it is, and is writing stories and producing stories that relate to those people's problems, that is something that we know builds trust. Um, and there are people who are working on sort of experimenting with badging systems you know, marking stories saying this is a story that has kind of a good housekeeping seal of approval because it's got vetted sources, it's from, you know, vetted journalists, etc. So there are different experiments going on. Um, but, you know, that is the, the $60 million question. Yes. Uh, hello. Okay. Um, I was interested are you, by... Are you a student here? Yes. So yeah. Yes, I'm a student here. I'm a sophomore. Great. Um, I was interested by what you said about the deregulation that happened um, in regards to the field of journalism and, and whether that was a good thing, a bad thing, and like kind of the balance of maintaining free speech, but at the same time kind of keeping journalists to their responsibility that they do have to the government and their ethical standards and things like that, and whether regulating it would help this issue of fake news? What a good question. I mean, journalism in this country is not a badged profession. It's not something where you go and get board certified the way you have to to be a lawyer or a doctor. In some countries, they do have that kind of a board standard. The U.S. doesn't. Obviously, we, um, you know, hold um, above all other of our Bill of Rights, the First Amendment, you know, freedom of speech and freedom of the press are among those freedoms in the First Amendment. And they're really fundamental. They're baseline to what our country values, its foundational values. And so it's really hard, I think, it would be hard to get a critical mass um, of decision makers in America to say we're going to do something to regulate speech. Um, but what that means is that there are people out there who basically can say whatever, even if it's not true, it still gets the same protections. I'm thinking of someone like Alex Jones, who runs this site that is also an online radio, online television called InfoWars. And, what's, and he was profiled by Megyn Kelly in the third episode of her new NBC evening show on Sundays. And that caused a lot of controversy, so you guys might have read about it back then. What I find so disturbing about Alex Jones is for something like 25 years, he's been pumping out com false conspiracy theories, complete bunk. Stuff like saying that the 9-11 attacks were an inside job, that the U.S. government was behind 9-11, or saying that the Sandy Hook massacre of all those two dozen children and teachers in the elementary school in Connecticut, Newtown, who were, who were killed by a mad gunman, that those were child actors, that it never happened, and that it was all faked to try to limit gun rights. I mean, there are some crazy people out there who have followings of millions and millions of people 
During the campaign, Donald Trump sat down with Alex Jones of InfoWars and did an interview with him. It was apparently Roger Stone, one of Donald Trump's advisors, who put the two of them together. And Donald Trump said, you have so much respect. You're so well thought of. I promise you I won't let you or your people down. And a lot of people criticized him at the time, saying, why are you giving this guy a platform? Why are you dignifying his show with your presence? Um, because he's a crazy person and so painful for the families of Newtown who lost their little five and six year old children that this man has gotten, you know, and continues to have a national platform. But the problem is if you say, well, you can't be a journalist. I mean, in my mind, he's not a journalist. He's just a purveyor of junk speech. But the system as we have it now does not limit that kind of speech. And this is a good question for you to bring up with your professors in your classes, because it's, it's ripe for a lot more debate. Anyone else? Yes. Um, my name is Kantalo. I'm a freshman from Japan. And I'm kind of interested in like journalism as business administration. So my question would be, how do you think the traditional media can run like profitable business on the scale, like journalism, j uh, journalistic enterprises, like fact checking, as kind of uh, and antithesis to economically motivated uh, fake news attempts. What a great question, and I hope that you solve the problem for all of us <laughs> and figure it out. If I knew the answer to that, how to make journalism profitable, again, um, you know, I would not be here talking about journalism ethics, but I would be running some news organization and helping other news organizations follow my lead on how to do that. I don't know the answer to that. And of course, newspapers were at one time extremely profitable, particularly if they were in markets where there was one dominant newspaper and therefore they dominated advertising, be that giant full page, you know, department store ads or classified advertising, which um, was effectively in some ways put out of business by Craigslist and other similar um, you know, sites that advertise things online so people didn't have to pay the same rates advertising in newspapers. There's also the whole problem of the internet with newspapers giving it away for free, putting their n news online and not charging people for it. It's sort of an original sin. The, Was the Wall Street Journal never did that. They've been really strict about having a paywall, but the, the New York Times was the first large news organization that was giving it away for free online so everybody else felt they had to follow and uh, it was really bad. People stopped paying for news because they figured they could get it for free. And now, um, of course, many news organizations will give you, say, 10 free articles a month or five free articles a month and after that you have to pay. But people have figured out all sorts of workarounds through Google and other ways to find these articles and not pay for them. And I think that's wrong. I mean, real journalism is not free. Real journalism costs money. You have to pay reporters. You have to pay editors. You have to pay for airplane tickets to go places to actually research things and find them out. You have to pay for Xeroxing of court records or downloading, you know, documents. I mean, it's not free. Fake news is free. You can just sit there and do it for free because you're just making it up. Real news is not free. And I would urge all of you um, to, you know, go home tonight and subscribe to your favorite news organization and pay for it. Um, you know, it's not just NPR and PBS that need your donations. Um, news organizations need money to be able to continue to produce the news. Just wait. Go ahead, tell me who you are. Uh, Leslie. And Communi community member. Great. What role or responsibility do you think social media sites have when it comes to the proliferation of fake news? I think they do have a real responsibility. And they, of course, have been very slow to admit that. They don't want to admit it. Um, they want it to sort of, they want the problem to not be their problem. And Facebook and Google and Twitter are among those who have said, we're not news organizations, we're merely platforms, and news exists on our platforms. Of course, the truth is that those sites would not get the traffic that they have were it not for news existing on their platform. This is another, I think, original sin of the news media, to allow their stuff to be circulated on platforms without demanding big time money for it. And, you know, Facebook, I think, makes way more money off of certain news sites' content than those news sites do. 
you know, just through the advertising and the eyeballs that they have. So they are doing some things. Facebook, since January of this year, has been involved in a fact-checking project that my colleague at Pointer, who runs what's called the International Fact-Checking Network, which is housed at Pointer, he's been involved in that. And it gets news um, fact-checking sites like Snopes and PolitiFact and um, you know, factcheck.org and Washington Post Fact Checker to participate. And what happens is when there's stories that circulate on Facebook that are flagged by users as questionable, those then get sent to the fact checkers. And the fact checkers check them out. And if two fact checking organizations say, no, this is bogus, then it gets a little flag on it. What Facebook has said is that they're not gonna take it off the site they, they, they say, we're not here to censor or regulate. If people want to read fake news, they can read fake news. But they put a little flag on it that says, are you sure you want to share this? So they let you know this has been flagged by at least two fact-checking sites as dubious. Are you sure you want to share it? We don't have all the data because Facebook hasn't shared that data. But... Um, they have indicated that it is having some effect, but the effect seems to be after 10 days. So it means that it can circulate around like wildfire around the internet, and then after 10 days, it, sort of people catch up and realize, oh, that's not real. Another thing that, ha and so they're less likely to share it after 10 days. Another thing that Facebook is doing is they're finally putting logos so that the news isn't all undifferentiated. Because a year ago, you look at it and it's like Infowars and the Washington Post. The stories look the same coming through your news feed. You don't know whether it's a multi, multi Pulitzer Prize winning organization that writes bulletproof stories where they've got you know 50 sources and they've spent a month on it versus Infowars that's just making it up. It just looks the same. So now by allowing those news organizations brands to appear, it's not as undifferentiated. It's easier for people to see what's a reliable news site or not. But I think it is true that they have been very slow, all of these news sites, all of these platforms, to, uh, to identify themselves or, or to take responsibility. They don't identify themselves as news organizations or media companies. This will be very brief. Sure, but one, before you go, sir, I think there was somebody else who had a question who hadn't gotten one before. Well, this is just a, fun, a, a very quick one. Is there any chance, or what is the chance, that we could get in print the major part of your presentation? Sorry. <laughs> I, just, I just do it live, so I'm sure that they may have made a recording of it, but I, I haven't written it out. So, sorry about that. I'm sorry. Um, is there anyone else who has a question? Yes, sir. He's coming around. Yes, please identify Thank you. yourself. Uh, Keith Nightingale, teach at DePaul. Thank um, you. What do uh, you teach? Uh, humanities courses. Okay. Uh, wasn't there actually a legal dispute about 10 years ago between uh, Google in particular, I think, and maybe some other sites like Yahoo back when it was a viable business, and uh, newspapers about whether the uh, uh, internet platforms could just scrape the headlines and show them. Uh, wasn't there a dispute like that which was lost by the news industry? Uh, it that that it, basically on First Amendment grounds that has pretty you know pretty much screwed the news industry in getting a revenue stream out of this, uh, except if you're the Wall Street Journal. Uh, you may be right. I don't know the answer to that, but. News organizations have also gone willingly, in some cases, headlong into this by participating in things like Facebook Live and creating basically free content for Facebook. And they do it, I've been told by senior news editors at you know, top national news organizations, that the reason they do it is because they feel they have to do it, that they have to be in the game, that if they, because the algorithm is such that if they don't create these Facebook Lives or the instant videos, Facebook has gone really heavy on video in the last year, that if they don't create these, that then they are, they are downgraded in the algorithm. And other news organizations' material will jump to the top of Facebook. And news executives know that a lot of people are coming to their information not by going to their homepage. So I'm an irregular news consumer because I consume news voraciously from all sort of trusted news subject, n news platforms or news 
um, organizations across the political spectrum, and I consume it through their home pages and through Twitter by sort of curating my own aggregation. Like I follow people who I know are going to be tweeting out stories I want to read, so that's how I do it. But I think most people come to their news really through social media, as what polling showed after 2016, that um, Pew had a study showing that 60% of Americans said that they got, that Facebook was their main source for news. What I think is, there are a couple things about that. One is, unless you have telemetry on someone, you don't really know if that's true. That 60% of people say that they think Facebook is their main source for news, but we don't really know unless we're tracking all of their movements on their computer or what they're seeing on TV and what they're picking up and reading at their kitchen table if they still subscribe to a print publication, which I hope you all do. Um, but so part of it is that news organizations have also given this sort of given away the house to some extent by feeling like they have to do it to stay in the game because that's where the eyeballs come to them now. Jonathan, was there any question you wanted to ask before we wrap up? I'm good. Mel, did you have a question? I did. Is it, are we out of time? No, it's go not, ahead. It's not urgent. Um, hi, I'm Meryl. I teach English and women's studies here. Hi. Hi. And can we go back to the question of trust? Uh, yeah, of course. Of, of, um, because I'm curious, because you, you had it, all the graphs were by Democrat, Republican, or Independent, or mostly. Um, can you break that down a little bit by other variables, like by gender and by race? I mean, it's, uh, you That's know, That's really interesting. I have not seen it broken down that way. I'm not the one who does these studies. Um, so I've pulled these graphics from survey and research organizations that do, and they have tended to look at it either as an aggregate or divided by political party. But that's a very interesting question. And you're now making me think because I've commissioned some research on media trust. And I'm going to send an email tonight to the guy who's doing it for me to ask him, is he breaking it down that way too? Because that's an excellent question. I, I don't know the answer. I, I do know that communities of color have... Um, have weak trust in certain institutions that are flip side, like weak trust in police, um, but higher trust in the media, interestingly, from some of the data that I've seen. But I would also expect that, that you're right, that a lot of communities who don't see themselves represented in the news might feel distrustful of the news if that's where your question is going. Well, that's, that's, it's partly... It's partly that. I mean, that's what I hope it would be. But I'm also slightly obsessed with this question of white women voting badly. <laughs> well, I in, mean, in, in, way, in ways that, you know, I, I, I have questions about that. I think I know what you're saying, but I think it goes to part of what I said earlier, that sometimes even if people are shown that, that a certain statement may be true, false, even if they're convinced that that statement is false, they may vote for that person anyway. So I think there were probably women, if what you're referring to is that there may have been women who saw the Access Hollywood tape and voted for Trump anyway, they have, may have thought, well, okay, yeah, locker room talk. Yeah, he said that. It's obvious it's on tape, but locker room talk, and I still want him to be president. So you can't blame people for that. If that's the way they feel, people have a right to vote however they want to vote, you know, as long as they have all the information. Um, so, you know, you can't force someone to agree with you. <laughs> you just have to give them the information, and then they make whatever decisions they make based on their upbringing, their socialization, their context, everything else. Miranda. Based on that, um, I think there are a lot of, my impression is that there were a lot of voters in this election who would overlook that because the other issues were taxes, abortion, uh, jobs in the Midwest, whatever, and that those would, pardon the pun, trump mm -hmm. something or as more unseemly as, you know, the Access Hollywood tape. But I wonder if if you have done any kind of analysis of reporting on those topics that, you know, explained why this might have happened. I don't personally do content analysis, yeah. but um, I know that what you're saying is right. 
And I know this even just, I mean, of course, we shouldn't take things anecdotally and extrapolate them to the nation. But I know anecdotally from, you know, reporting at Trump rallies that people said exactly what you're saying, that, okay, well, that may be, he may have said that, his number is about, he may be saying he's going to build a wall. And, you know, if you say to people, okay, but actually Mexicans aren't rapists and, you know, the number of crimes committed by native born Americans as a percentage, native born Americans commit crime at a higher rate than even illegal immigrants. I mean, it's not surprising. Illegal immigrants don't want to get caught. <laughs> so they're less like, it, it, it just statistically, according to FBI statistics, they commit less crime than native born Americans. You can tell people that information, but in their gut, they can still say, yeah, but I still feel like those Mexicans are taking my jobs. I still want that wall. You know, you can say, well, actually, white supremacists and you know, right-wing nationalist terrorist groups have been responsible post 9-11 for more deaths from terrorist acts in this country than jihadi terrorists. And people say, they may say, well, I don't believe it, even if you show them the FBI data, um, but they still feel in their gut that an outsider is more threatening to them. So that's the thing. Like I said, a lot of this is about emotion. Um, more than it is necessarily about fact. And I think that it goes back to trust, building trust by news organizations, building bridges to communities is really important by caring and writing about issues, reporting on issues that are important to communities. And again, this is something where the national news media cannot do this. Local news media has to do this. And this is why the rebuilding of local news media is so, so important to restoring credibility or restoring trust in this country. But another thing is breaking through these partisan echo chambers. If, you know, person A only watches Fox all day long and reads the Drudge Report and person B only watches MSNBC all day long and reads The Nation, they're living in two different worlds, two completely different worlds. And they can do that by frontally, by going straight to the sites, those news sites or channels, or they can do it by defriending people (laughs) on their Facebook feed so that they only get the echo and confirmation of what they already believe. And, um, you know, there has to be a way to build conversations where we're listening to other sides. But I also personally believe that, you know, yes, we all we all have a right to our feelings, to our own feelings and our own opinions, but we don't have a right to our own facts. That, you know, accuracy and facts need to be reasserted, even in an age when there are disputed you know, where people don't agree on the underlying facts. That's a real problem. CNN did an ad campaign a couple weeks ago where they showed a picture of an apple and they said, this is an apple. This is not a banana. Some people may scream banana in all capital letters, but that is not going to make this as a banana. This is an apple. And the point of their ad campaign was to say facts are facts and you may not like them, but facts are immutable. I happen to agree that facts are immutable, not from a political standpoint, um, but just I think facts are facts, but we are unfortunately in an era when people don't agree on the basic facts. Anyone else? One last, one last gasp after the shot clock. The shot clock already went. One more. So I'm Steve Raines. Hi, uh, Steve. Previously in the psychology department Great. here, now retired. So uh, I was thinking about what you had to say earlier about trust and uh, the possibility that we were at a high watermark during Watergate. After. Or after Watergate. Mm-hmm. I think 1976 is the high watermark on that trust survey. I was a graduate student at the time, and uh, um, I remember that period watching the news every evening and one moment after another wondering whether the Constitution and the the rule of law in our country was going to prevail in that situation. Um, You gave, uh, so you gave credit to the, to, to the media for uh, again, the high water mark at that time, and I'm wondering if you think, if you, what your feeling is about uh, the situation we're in now, 
at, at that time, there was nothing like Fox News to provide a, a, a countervailing position. You could see the some partisanship on the, the Irving Committee, um, but the, the media were not that different. It covered the events of the day each evening. Um, do you think that we will eventually come to a time where um, the media will reach another high water mark in terms of its coverage of um, the election and the possibility, not the certainty, mm -hmm. but the possibility of Russian involvement. And no. again, the Russian involvement is real. Yeah, That's okay. not a possibility. Yeah. Po you, let's, uh, you and I agree. Yes. let's talk we, about the we fact agree on that. collusion is a possibility That's, that has not been that's proven. The other but part. Russian involvement is okay. established. Yeah. Um, and so I don't really understand where the president is coming from when he says, I talked to Vladimir Putin and he again assured me that Russia didn't interfere. Then it means he doesn't, he doesn't believe 17 American intelligence agencies. So I really, that doesn't make sense to me because the American intelligence community, our own spy services have said that Russia did interfere. So I think that's pretty well accepted by um, the Senate, the House of Representatives, you know, the intel agencies, I don't know why the president doesn't accept it. That's a different question from the question of collusion with any members of the Trump campaign or Trump orbit. Those are two separate questions. Um, look, I do think that we're already seeing a golden age of some forms of accountability journalism this year. I mean, just think about the work that Politico has done where they exposed the um, flights the airline flights taken at taxpayer expense by a number of cabinet secretaries, and it led to Tom Price of HHS having to step down because he had billed a whopping half a million dollars in private charter jets that he was flying around all over the place, including internationally, half a million dollars. So he had to step down, but he hasn't offered to pay any of that money back to us. Um, that's one example. The Pittsburgh Post-Gazette was able to unearth text messages between Representative Tim Murphy, the congressman who represents Monroeville outside of Pittsburgh. Um, he is a very staunch anti-abortion congressman, was, um, but he his text messages um, showed that he was actually having an affair. He was married and having an affair with a woman, and when she got pregnant, he urged her to have an abortion. So that kind of information that came out and showed the hypocrisy and sort of abuse of his staff, I, I don't mean sexual abuse, I mean like yelling and screaming and being abusive towards his staff, eventually that was exposed by the Pittsburgh Post because that he had to step down. So there's been a lot of, um, I mean, Harvey Weinstein, that's a great example, accountability journalism. And of course, you've seen the avalanche effect from that of all sorts of other people in all different industries being accused um, by people who say they were, who were coming out with their names and their faces, a fifth woman today, who says that Roy Moore um, abused her when she was a teenager and put her face out there after all these years and told her story. So there's a lot of accountability journalism going on now. I think what you're asking, though, is specifically about the Mueller investigation and the coverage and how that will be covered. And I think the sad truth is that no matter what the Mueller investigation finds, the mainstream media will report what the Mueller investigation said. And both extreme left and extreme right media will probably say, that's not true. There's a hidden story. You know, no. That's not the real story, and they will convince their audiences that it's not true, um, regardless. So I think they're, you're right that, I mean, I wasn't aware of it during Watergate time, but you're right to point out that there wasn't a sort of anti-mainstream media that had the power and reach that the anti-mainstream media do now. Thanks. Good question. All right. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate your audience. Thank you. Thank you.